Hey, good afternoon or morning, everyone. This is Mark Hamlin here, and today we're going to talk a little bit about MES within Business Central. We're using MES with Business Central, and specifically Shopfloor Insight and the related tools to that from InsightWorks. So Shopfloor Insight uh, is one part of sort of that, that manufacturing process. And around that are a number of other applications that we provide. Now, of course, there's the, the base business central stuff, you know, the core, you know, production orders, and all those sorts of things. But all these other tools help us to actually make things happen in business central. So the first one in here is, you know, when we do the planning. So, you know, business central obviously has planning tools, planning worksheet, requisition worksheet, those sorts of things. We have an enhanced version of, of that that has planning worksheet, but we can also do forecasting. We can do a lot of production analysis, like variance analysis uh, for routings or components, costs, margins, things like that. Uh, all of those sorts of things within the enhanced planning plan. So this, again, allows you to, you know, better plan your, your production. Once we've planned it, we want to send it out and, and get it properly scheduled, right? The, the planning worksheet uh, in, in Business Central doesn't really schedule. It does a, a decent job of planning it, but it's not going to be a schedule that you can actually execute on the shop floor. So we send it to... Either one of these guys. Again, a graphical scheduler, free. You can plug it in. You can visualize the production orders. You can set all sorts of rules to change colors or change the way things look or show different things on the chart, um, all that kind of stuff. And then you can drag and drop stuff around, which is great if you don't have a lot of production orders or if the base business central does a decent job scheduling it. Because I can sit there and you know spend a, a little bit of time moving things around to make it look pretty. But if you've got a lot of volume, what you probably want is an automated production schedule, and that's MXAPS. So in a lot of cases, you can plug it in, hit a button, and you've got a, a schedule that you can actually execute on the shop floor. But you can get very, you know, uh, detailed with that schedule. So it can look at material constraints, labor constraints, tooling constraints. There's a finite capacity schedule to make sure that the schedule that's produced in the system can actually work on the shop floor when it's set up there. Now, once it's out on the shop floor, that's when we get into what we, you know, typically call MES, where we're capturing, you know, the execution data from the shop floor. So for that, we use shop floor insight. And I can capture really any activity information, material information, quality information, things like that, that that's occurring on the shop floor. And, you know, any of the completion information, like the output or the time, will then get fed back into the scheduling as well. So that real-time feedback from the shop floor is very important for production planners, for salespeople, everything else. The customer phones up, says, you know, what's happening with, with my job? Then go in, and because we've got shop floor insight, we know exactly, you know, where that is in the process, how much time has elapsed on it, you know, we can infer what's left to do on it, all those sorts of things. So it's not just for, you know, the shop floor personnel, you know, reporting their time as the, the most basic example. It really applies to everyone in the uh, organization because the production planner can see what's going on. The shop floor supervisor knows what's going on. Sales people, all of that. So anyway, shop floor inside, we capture the execution information. And then, of course, once we've completed the production, it goes out to our order fulfillment worksheet to figure out what we can ship today. And then either WMS Express or Warehouse Insight to, you know, scan barcodes if you want to do that. And then out to Dynamic Ship, which I like the free shipping one. You can do LTL, it can do, you know, um, international shipments. You can do a whole bunch of stuff uh, to get your product out there. But one other quick mention on Warehouse Insight here. Uh, you know, if all you care about is consumption output, you're not really tracking labor time or activities or things like that. Warehouse Insight might actually be the better choice for your shop floor because it can do consumption output. It doesn't track labor time and things like that. But it's, uh, you know, you run it on a tablet or, or whatever you want to do. And you've got a very good tool for managing your material, not just consumption output, but everything you do with, with inventory. All right. But really what we're going to focus here is uh, on shop floor insight. And within shop floor insight, there's a bunch of capabilities. I'm not going to go, uh, do this, uh, you know, talk about each individual one of these. The key point, all of these capabilities, all these features together give us the ability to make it easier for people to execute the work on the shop floor, make it easier for people in the office to analyze what's going on and those sorts of things. Okay. So this provides the, the personnel on the shop floor, the tools they need to do the job, the personnel within the office, tools they need to figure out what's going on. 
Now, on top of that, for the payroll side of things, we do have time and attendance built in. So it's not an extra cost. There's extra implementation for, you know, training, payroll, and a bunch of other things, but nothing major. But that time and attendance, you know, if you've got a, a physical punch clock or you want a physical punch clock, you can get rid of that and you can use the built-in time and attendance capabilities within Shopfloor Insight, which allows us to, you know, clock, uh, keep track of when people clock in, you know, by routing rules, all sorts of things. Um, do overtime and double time calculations if you want. So we can automatically do those calculations and then send all of that detail to your, your payroll system through a, a text file or an API or something like that. The default is, is text file. And we could also do light shift scheduling. And what that means is you can create schedules for individuals or groups. And that says, hey, this week you're working days, next week you're working evenings, the week after you're working days, that sort of thing. So we can create those schedules, and then we can compare the time and attendance clock ends against the employee's schedule as well. All right, so a whole bunch of stuff we can do there. Uh, I'm going to cover almost all of this in the in the demo. But again, if you have questions on any of these specific things, uh, just let me know. All right, now, um, with that, let's talk about how... Uh, you know, we deploy shop floor insight into uh, the shop floor. So most often it's deployed as a fixed terminal. What that means is you've got a station out there, uh, typically multiple stations, right? You don't want people walking, you know, 100 feet to scan in. You want stations close by to where, where people are working. And it's a fixed terminal. It could be sitting on a desk. It could be, be on a, you know, stand, whatever. And people are going to walk up and scan what they're working on. And so scanning is one one option. They can also use a touch screen as well. But a fixed terminal typically means we've got something out there running that, that they walk up to the scan or, or interact with, I should say. And what's becoming most popular recently is, is a Chromebook. And the Chromebook is, is nice because it's an all-in-one little unit, uh, no moving fan, right? So if you've got a dusty environment, things like that, it's not going to suck things up and clog up and overheat. Uh, and it's cheap, you know, 150 bucks, and I've got a, a monitor, keyboard, you know, a touchpad, and just plug a scanner into it, and I'm, I'm good to go, right? Like, it's it's pretty good. But um, thin clients, VMs, Chromeboxes, tablets, all of that kind of stuff work. Um, and, you know, if you've got a closet full of old, like, you know, I guess with Windows 7 or Windows 10 PCs that you're not using anymore or laptops, maybe you want to throw those out there. All right. Um, here's an example of uh, – this is actually – when this picture was taken, this uh, – this terminal had been out there for, for over 10 years. This is using a little thin client uh, terminal here, running a VM, and they've got a laminated sheet here that they're scanning, you know, codes like fixed assets, like if you're doing maintenance or break codes or, you know, all sorts of different things that aren't, uh, aren't ever going to change. So that's a, a nice little setup there, right? They've got a bunch of codes they can scan, and of course they're going to be scanning production orders as well. So that's if you have a, a fixed terminal uh, out there. Now, if you want all your individual employees to sort of have their own interface, like their own tablet or uh, phone or something like that, either for internal use, right, in the shop, or maybe they're they're doing work outside the shop. They're doing commissioning or field service or something like that. Well, there is the ability to run this on a phone or a tablet using, you know, sort of the standard Business Central application, and it's tailored specifically for shop floor where I can, you know, swipe to clock in and clock out and those sorts of things. Now, you can also run this interface on a fixed terminal. So if you just want to run Business Central in a fixed terminal, um, that's fine as well. And we're going to cover off the pros and cons of that uh, a little bit later when we talk about licensing, because each one of these guys, if you're logging into Business Central, you're going to need a, a team member or full license, uh, typically, right? Um, anyway, that is the, the personal device interface we'll have a look at. Now, when we are deploying the, the fixed terminals, right, so the interface that I'm going to show you like you, you saw in that picture, there is one cool little thing. Uh, and when we deploy that fixed terminal, like on a Chromebook or something like that, it's just running a browser. But we do have a little service that's running on your, your on-premises network, right? So this can run on a laptop or somebody's PC or even one of the shop terminals if it's running Windows. So it's a Windows service that runs. And some of the, the, the two cool things on this is what it does is all those terminals, instead of them all having to log in and talk to Business Central directly, they talk to this little communication hub that's installed, and that talks to Business Central. So now you only have one point of configuration to talk to Business Central, 
and everything goes through that. So it simplifies the security and user setup and everything else pretty dramatically. And the other nice thing about that is the shelf floor terminals can be locked down so they don't have internet access. Now you may want to because you want to have people get drawings and things like that. But what you can do is you can lock down those terminals so they can't get out on the internet. So your, your night shift guys aren't sitting there on the Chromebook browsing stuff they shouldn't because hey, they don't have internet access. Everything is going through this, this local uh, communications hub that we've got set up here. So just keep in mind, the reason I mention this is if you install our trial version from AppSource, you, to use it properly, you will have to have this service installed. You can get a hold of us. We can help you out. Uh, and you get to download for that, run the setup wizard, and uh, and get it up and running. All right. Now, with that, it's all the background, with one exception. I'm going to jump into the demo here in a second, and I just wanted to point out what I'll be doing in the demo. So, again, we can use touch screens. I'll talk about that in, in a sec. But what I'll be doing, for the most part, is scanning barcodes. And there's two types of barcodes I'll be scanning. One is what we call an employee badge. <clears throat> and this is generated from within Business Central. So there's a report printed out on, you know, perforated card stock or whatever, laminated, whatever you want to do. Uh, slap it in a, you know, sort of clip-on badge holder. And now the employees have a barcode they can scan to identify themselves at the terminal. You don't want to use this. The employee can type in their employee ID and, and you know, just manually type. But this makes it very simple to walk up to the terminal, unlock it, and get going. And then over here on the right-hand side, that's, uh, you know, the, the sample production order report that we include with the system that has the barcodes on it. If you already have a shop traveler that goes out there and you like it and you just want to add barcodes to it, no problem. You can just go in and have uh, your partner uh, add, you know, the appropriate barcodes to your existing traveler and you're good to go. Or if you want to use a shop floor one, this looks like we've got one barcode for setup and one barcode for runtime. And this one barcode per operation. And that's all we scan. So these are the barcodes I'll be scanning as we get into uh, the demo. All right. Now, um, there is a question here on the uh, on the terminal. Uh, and uh, so that, that terminal thing I mentioned, it does not change the licenses you need. And I'll talk about licenses uh, here in a bit. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to the, the license question. All right. So with that, Let's actually jump in and uh, look at a demo of a few of these things. So the first thing uh, I'm going to do is jump in and talk a little bit about uh, graphical scheduler because, you know, this type of view is important when we're talking about MES, manufacturing execution. Number one, you're going to need a schedule that, before you can execute, and this helps you do scheduling. And again, if you need automated production scheduling, that's MX APS, right? Automated production scheduling. Uh, there's lots of uh, videos online on that, on how that works, but you hit a button or just have it run in the job queue, and you get a schedule that you can actually work on the next day or the next shift in the shop floor, and it takes everything into account that you need to take. However, if you want to do this manually, you know, here I've got an order that's late, so it's it's turned red, right? So you can turn it, you know, change colors, all that sort of thing. These guys here, you know, it shows me what production orders need to run. I can drag and drop these things around, do whatever I like. Uh, on them. I can change the colors. If I want to drill into the details, I can or it related and, you know, drill directly into the routing, all those sorts of things. Uh, this bar up here uh, shows me my loading. So I added that in myself. The, the default view when you install graphical scheduler just shows you your production orders. You can actually go in here and create whatever views you want. So I've got assembly orders, I've got production orders, I've got all sorts of things. But in here, you can come in, and I just added this this uh, work center loading uh, thing, and and here's where you set up the text that shows up in the in the thing, or how tall you want uh, the the chart to look. And if I wanted to add in, you know, maybe uh, my purchase order receipts or my warehouse picks or something like that, I can come in here and add whatever I want to that chart. So you can create all these custom views to sort of help you figure out what's happening in the shop floor and what you need to to work on. And now here are the colors, right? So here's, you know, if it's late, I turn it red and, and gray, uh, that sort of thing. So you can set up colors, all sorts of stuff. So this tool here, again, this is free, Graphical Scheduler. If you're on the uh, cloud version of Business Central, slap it in. Away you go. You can use it as is. Don't have to tell us that you're using it or anything. There's no registration. And you can drag and drop and visualize your schedule. Okay, so that's that's the first thing. Schedule it. And as things are in progress, you can update the, the text or it says routing status there, say in progress, all those sorts of things. 
you can do whatever you like here. All right. So that's sort of the, the starting point when, when we get a time ask is visualizing what's going on on the shop floor. Now, now that we've got this, maybe I, I drag and drop and schedule a bunch of stuff. Now that we've got this, we want the employees to come into the shop and, and start working. So uh, if I'm not going to go into it in a ton of detail, but we do have this time clock interface, and this is for the time and attendance piece, where if we want to capture the clock in for the day, clock out for the day, you know, do um, uh, attendance messages like somebody showed up late or they showed up early or they didn't show up or they showed up when they weren't supposed to, all that stuff. Anyway, all the time and attendance stuff you'd expect. That's all there. Uh, and if you have a webcam uh, on this device that I'm scanning into, we can also take photos of the people when they clock in and clock out so you don't get buddy punchy and all that kind of stuff. But the way this works is, you know, as an employee, I'd simply walk up, I'd scan my badge, it clocks me in, uh, the colors and sounds and everything you can, you can change to your heart's content, and that's it. So if I have, you know, four or five people in a line, you know, at the change room, like this would be sitting outside the change room or whatever, coming in, They'd simply walk up. They'd scan their badge, scan their badge, scan their badge, and now those three people have clocked in for the day. Okay? And again, then we can calculate, you know, overtime, uh, all of that kind of stuff, and send it to your payroll system automatically. Okay. Now, you don't have to use this at all, because the next thing, once you're in the shop floor, you'll see this interface. And this interface uh, is just running in a web browser. So I've got it running in sort of app mode, but this, again, if you're running on a Chromebook or VM or something like that. This is just a browser, and this is what I'm going to be using to um, to log what I'm doing in the facility. So step one, it says, hey, scan your batch login. And again, you're going to have employees, you know, type their ID in there. And I'm going to focus on barcoding uh, at first, but again, touch screen is, is definitely doable as well. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk up as an employee. I'm going to scan my batch here. And by the way, this is the first time you do this. That's now connecting to Business Central. So, again, that's going to that, that uh, communications hub service there. It's connected to Business Central, and we're live with Business Central. Anything that you see showing up on the screen or anything I do goes to Business Central in real time. So anybody, CSR, production plan, or whatever, knows exactly what's going on at the shop floor. Now, what it did for, for this particular employee, it starts with their time card. These are all the activities they've done so far today. It's blank because I haven't done anything today. This is you know, when I clocked in this morning. So now what I'm going to do is I'm simply going to scan uh, the activity that I, I plan on working. So I grab uh, my production order traveler, like you saw on the PowerPoint there, scan a, a barcode, and it clocks me in, and, and we're good to go. Okay? So that's it. It's the old joke I always make. It's like the Roadrunner cartoons. I go beep, beep, and that's my only interaction with, with this thing. Beep, beep, run off and do my work. And that's it. I scan my badge. I scan what I'm working on, and I'm good to go. The screen will lock after whatever you set it to, 30 seconds or whatever. Or I can scan my badge again to lock it, where somebody can come up behind me, scan their badge to to then you know work on their uh, their activities. Okay. So if I scan my badge again, it just locks the screen, and I go off and I do my work. So that's the most basic use case for shop floor insight is capturing those activities that occur on the shop floor and calculating the amount of labor time that went into those activities. So now I want to scan into that. <clears throat> that clock is running, and it's, it's keeping track of the elapsed time that I'm spending on that particular production. Well, notice I scanned the one uh, barcode, and it brought up everything I needed, production order number, line number, operation works, and all that kind of stuff. Now, uh, just for fun, I'm going to scan a different employee here. And this employee doesn't see their time card to start with. What they see is what we call a dispatch list. And the dispatch list is, you know, their schedule for today. You can, uh, you know, explicitly assign work to the individual person. So I'm in here as Linda. Explicitly assign work to that individual person. Or what I've done is just filter on operation. So I could filter on work center or operation number or anything basically on that production order to give them a list of all the things they need to work on, uh, you know, in the next hour or day or whatever you've got it set up. And this is quite often where we see people using touch screens as well, right? So on a, a touch screen, I just zoomed in a little here. Nice big area to tap, so I can tap on that. And when I do that, you know, her view, she doesn't see a bunch of other stuff. She sees a picture of what she's supposed to be working on. And then when I'm happy, I hit clock on. And now she's clocked on to that activity and, uh, and we're good. 
go. Okay, so these views that you see here uh, are can be by uh, employee, by group, uh, or global. So I can have a different view for for different employees. All right. So anyway, that's now Linda is clocked into that particular activity. She's going to scan her badge and walk out. By the way, if you have a dedicated terminal at a work center, like maybe it's a laser uh, cutter or something like that, somebody's in scan in the morning, and that terminal will stay unlocked all day potentially, and they're, all they're going to do is go beep, beep every time they need to, to track an activity. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to scan back into uh, my activity here, or my, my type card, <clears throat> and it shows me again what, what I scanned in initially, and a few other things that we'll get into in a sec here. But now let's say I'm, I'm done that, and uh, i got to head off to the, the safety meeting. So um, what I do is I just scan the next activity I'm going to be working on, and it automatically clocks me out of the prior activity and starts the next activity. So it makes it very easy for the shop floor personnel to use because they're just scanning, hey, I'm going to work on this, and that's all they have to worry about. Beep, this is what I'm working on, and we're done. So this toolbox meeting here clocked me out of this activity. Automatically calculates the elapsed time on that. And this is in hours, but you can change that to minutes or whatever, and that can be you know, for a work center or whatever you want to do. And uh, I also actually have it set up so that I can manually, just using the error keys, I can come in here, and I can manually edit this time if I want. Normally that's disabled so that only a supervisor can can fix the time if I screwed up. Maybe I forgot to, to clock in at 11 or something. Supervisor could fix it. The way I have it set up is I can edit it. And, and where that's kind of handy, too, is if you have, uh, to put it politely, less than diligent workforce where they're constantly forgetting to do things, you, you might allow them to do that. Or if, um, you know, you're in an environment where you're working on jobs, potentially, and we'll talk about jobs in a sec, or something where they're spending, like, the full day on one activity. Well, maybe at the end of the day, they scan or select what they work on and type in eight hours, or six hours, or whatever. So you have the ability to do manual entry or the clock in, clock out type entry. Okay. Now, this toolbox meeting uh, activity here, on, and also I should mention the colors. I set these colors myself. You can have whatever color scheme you want. So I just said green if it's, uh, you know, active. And anyway, you can set whatever colors you like. Now, um, you don't have to go to this level of detail where I'm tracking everything that's occurring on the shop floor. Right? So I did a toolbox meeting, the fact that it being, you know, a cleaning task or something like that. It's easy for the people to record what they're doing. Uh, and you get a lot of good detail for, for reporting if you use these what we call non-productive non, uh, codes. But you don't have to do that if you don't want. You can just focus on production orders and leave it there or, or jobs as well. So we support production orders, non-productive time, uh, fixed assets for asset maintenance, if you have mill rights out there and, and things like that. You can record that time that they've spent on fixed assets without having jobs or production orders. Uh, and service orders we also support. And so all of those uh, you can you can use. So we're focusing mostly on production orders here, but uh, I can go in and scan you know, job tasks and then job planning lines to record time or use job dispatch list and get a list of all the job tasks in the system and clock on to a specific task, uh, job task as well. So we've got all those capabilities. All right. Now, um, what I'm going to do next, I'm just going to, you know, lock the screen here. So I'm, I'm going off. I'm doing that work on that job. We're going to give it a few seconds to calculate some elapsed time. I'm going to come back, unlock the screen. It automatically collapses everything that's no longer active and keeps this open. And now I'm going to scan uh, into a, a production order again. And let's talk about some of the other things that we can do. So, so far, all we've done is beep, beep, you know, we're the road runners, and we're capturing labor time against specific activities. And again, this is real time in Business Central. I can go and see all of this stuff happen. Now that I'm in here under this, this production order, um, and by the way, we can override the work center. So you can scan a barcode to switch work centers. If, if I decide I'm not doing it here, I'm using the, the robot welder or something like that, I can I can scan a barcode to, to change uh, uh, work centers and all sorts of things. But now that I'm into this, uh, what we see over here on the side is some additional information. So basically some fact boxes here. And here's some uh, linked documents. So I, I added this on a previous demo a while ago. I keep forgetting to check it out. But this is just a link out to, to Google, right? So I can click on that. It'll open up Google in a, in a browser and away I go. 
more importantly, though, is this assembly diagram. So what that is, is that's a document that's linked within Business Central. And you can use Doc Extender to do that, right? So I drag and drop this assembly diagram onto this uh, this item number or potentially this production number. And now when I hit that guy, it opens up and it shows me the assembly diagram or a video or an Excel sheet or whatever the heck you want to link to that production order or that item, right? So it could be, you know, a DWG file or SolidWorks file or whatever you want to show out there uh, on the shop floor. And the nice thing about this is, by the way, if you've got a library of you know, engineering drawings and things like that that are sort of in an on-premise file server somewhere, you don't have to move those to the cloud to be able to access them from shop floor inside. We can set it up so that you can retain your existing storage of all those drawings and everything else, and we can still access it through shop floor inside to your local file store as well. All right, so that's the links. Up above, we've got these work instructions. So again, if... if uh, Work instructions aren't enough. That's when you, you get into the, the diagrams and things like that. But here, these are just coming off the routing. So again, it's all coming out of Business Central. There's no separate database you need to configure or work with. And you can set whatever work instructions you like. And you can also, in here through configuration, set up statistics for the production order, like you can show a laps tie on a bunch of other goodies in here if you want to see them. Now, uh, a few other things that we can we can look at. Um, so let me just hide those. While well, you saw the picture already, that's, um, you know, with, with Linda, she just had the, the picture visible. Um, but one of the other things that we can do is uh, the bill of materials. So we can do consumption and output from shop floor. So the consumption is basically point of use consumption, right? So if I'm in there and I want to manually enter what I've consumed, this is what I'd use it for. You know, if you're using back flushing and forward flushing and all that kind of stuff, that's fine. You don't ever have to look at this. But the value in this, uh, especially, is if you have lot numbers or serial numbers that you're grabbing at point of use. So if I go grab something off the shelf that has a serial number, I can enter or scan that serial number right here without having to write down, or lot number that I'm using or things like that. So if, if these were lot number enabled or serial number enabled, I could actually record that lot or serial number at point of use through here, just either by typing or scanning. And even if I'm doing back flushing, I might want to come in here and indicate that I've, I've scrapped some of this material, right? So I can come in here and, you know, record scrap and, and all sorts of stuff beyond what was back flushed or, uh, or forward flushed. And so we can do that consumption. Um, we can also do output. And so output, we can do intermediate output or finished goods output. And when we're doing uh, the uh, finished goods, we can uh, indicate serial number, the law numbers we're producing. We can uh, indicate a bunch of stuff. We can add it to license plating if you're using your WMS. And we can do quality inspections at point of output as well. So here's my, my output history so far. And we can go in, you know, record strap, record the output quantities, lot numbers, serial numbers, license plates, quality inspections. All of that can be done when we do this output. So even if you don't care about your, your time, how much time you're spending on it, you can just use this for output and consumption if you like. However, if this is all you care about, Warehouse Insight might be a better choice because it does consumption output and a whole bunch of other material handling type functions as well. Incidentally, I don't have to clock in to do consumption output. If this is mostly what you care about, like if you all you want to do is say, I'm going to perform output on this particular operation and I want to record who did it, I can go in from the dispatch list here and this one isn't filtered, like Linda had hers filtered to Operation 10. But I can come in here, hit Output. That can automatically clock me into that operation, record the output, and store it in Business Central. And what that gives you is it gives you that level of traceability that you don't get out of standard Business Central. What we now get when we're looking at this, not only do we have traceability for lot and serial number and all those sorts of things, we have labor traceability as well. So I know exactly who did this work when they did it, all of those sorts of things are tracked within Business Central. And same thing with output. I can say exactly who did the output. We track that specific employee that did all of that work. So it's another level of traceability for your quality of warranty programs. All right. Um, let's see. And speaking of quality, uh, let's actually have a look at the quality inspections. So quality inspections, uh, the quality inspector module that we have, can be used anywhere in Business Central. So even if you've got custom tables, maybe you're doing rental or something like that, 
you can assign a quality inspection to any record, any sort of entity within Business Central uh, that you like. Now, uh, by default, though, it works with production, receiving, you know, all of that kind of stuff. So all the standard things, bin movements, those sorts of things. But you can use it anywhere for, for receiving inspections and, and uh, production inspections. So on the production side, if you've got that set up, what it did was it created this, this test for me based on the, the specifics uh, that I defined in the template and everything else. And it now allows me to come in and record the values for this. So what that looks like is basically an entry form. Now, this particular one requires a lot number. So I've said, you know, to do this test, you have to specify the lot number that you're testing. And so I specify the lot number I'm testing, and it loads up this entry form where I can enter the values for that specific lot number in it, or serial number if, if you prefer. And uh, you can think of this like a, a data entry form where we're capturing additional attributes for manufacturing. In this case, it, it does, you know, it is set up to be sort of actual measurements like, and we can set up tolerances and all those sorts of things. But this could just be a bunch of notes you want to add or a checklist to say, yes, no, I did this, I did that, whatever you want to do. So it can be, you know, uh, numerical values like decimals, integers, whatever. It could be, you know, text. It can be drop down lists. Uh, it can be lookup lists to other tables, even custom tables within a business central, all of those kinds of things. And then based on those entries, it'll flag it as a pass or a fail. And what's nice about this is regardless of whether it's a pass or fail on, on the results of this test, we can do all sorts of things. We can send teams messages. We can kick off an NCR, uh, you know, a data capture. We can, you know, do almost anything you like, block the lot number, block the serial number, whatever you want to do based on the results of these, these tests. So that quality inspector module that integrates with the shop floor, very robust, definitely worth looking at if you're curious about capturing quality information out on the shop floor, or if you just have, uh, you know, quality inspectors running around with uh, a tablet or something like that, or if you have a lab where things are delivered to your metrology lab or, or uh, you know, your students lab or whatever it is, and they're doing measurements and entering it directly. But out here on the shop floor interface, I'm able to see, you know, the, the types of things I need to capture, the attributes I need to record. I can hit that and record those values. And again, that's directly within Business Central tied to this production. Okay. Now, um, a couple, one of the things that I, I, I missed and there's a question on um, is, you know, what I, why I, scanned this production one and then I scanned the next thing, it, it clocked me out of that production. Line. Well, what if I have an operator working on multiple production orders simultaneously? Well, no problem. If it was a problem, I wouldn't have brought it up. But what what that means is we have a couple of different ways of working on multiple production orders simultaneously. Uh, the first one is batching. So what that means is, is if I'm at a laser cutter and I'm doing, you know, cutting a, a sheet and I've got five production orders on that, on that plate that I'm cutting, um, I would scan those five production orders in. It won't clock me out of all of them. I'm going to batch those five together. I'm going to do the work. And then we're going to clock off that batch, and it's going to split the time proportionally across all those production orders. That's also very handy if I have very short operations. Maybe I have a mixing or a cutting operation or something where, you know, every production order is three or four minutes to do. Well, I don't want to be clocking in and out every three or four minutes. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take a stack of those. I'm going to scan in 20 of them for the next hour. I'm going to work for an hour, and then I'm going to clock out of that batch, and it'll automatically split the time across those production orders. Okay. The other one is maybe I'm a machinist, and I've got two uh, two machines that I'm running simultaneously, but they're not really a batch. They're not running you know, together. So I'm allowed to do that as well. I can clock in and out of those production orders independently. I can't have multiple production orders running at the same time if I'd like. And on top of that, we can capture labor time independently of machine time. So, you know, if I'm running two production orders, uh, you know, all day for eight hours, you know, I don't want to record 16 hours of labor necessarily. Maybe you do. You have that option. But I want to record eight hours of labor in 16 hours of machine time. Well, you can do that, right? So we can capture that machine time independently of the labor time as well. All right. So... Now, uh, a few questions that I'll, I'll quickly jump into. So as I mentioned, everything that you do here 
is real time with the business temp. So if I was supposed to, you know, work on this, you know, maybe at, at 10 o'clock and, and have it all done, that's what the schedule said to do. And I, I'm not done until, until noon here. The next time I run that schedule, it's going to take that into account. Now, this is assuming you're running the MX APS schedule, right? Because that's looking at what's happening on the shop floor and providing a realistic schedule uh, to, to what to do next. Well, it's going to take that into account and schedule that remaining time accordingly. If you're just using the graphical scheduler, that's not going to do anything because that's just using the base business central functionality. Like if I, if I work on this thing five hours later than I was supposed to, business central doesn't care, right? It doesn't care about the times or the quantities or whatever. It's going to leave that schedule the way it is. If you're running MX APS. It's going to take the feedback from the shop floor and it's going to update that schedule accordingly. There's another question on the layout. Yeah, the, whether you can customize the layout, absolutely. So the way I've got it set up on this one, uh, I set it up so that it's on a per user basis. So whatever things I show, columns that I hide or show, all that kind of stuff are going to be saved for me specifically. But I could have locked that down so that the individual you know, users can't make any changes to the layout uh, and you just do it at the administrative level. Those kinds of things uh, are possible as well. Okay, so... Your, your abilities to configure the layout include, you know, the fields that you show, um, you know, the fact boxes that you show, the colors, um, the, um, you know, a few of the other things in there. If you want to customize it, like by adding buttons or removing buttons and things like that, that's a customization that requires some development, but you do have access to that. This is just HTML and JavaScript. You get everything, all the source code you can go in. And, you know, if you have the internal expertise, do whatever the heck you want, or you can ask us to, to make any changes if you need them. So we, we try and avoid making code changes. Usually it's just through configuration that we want to make those changes. All right. Um, now, uh, there's another question, uh, on, you know, capturing, you know, other activities and things like that. So it's specifically on, on downtimes and, and that sort of thing. So we do have the ability on here. I didn't actually configure this. But we do have the ability to record downtime. There is a, a graphical scheduler that lives within Shopfloor Insight, very similar to the one that runs within Business Central. It allows you to record equipment downtime right from the shop floor. Okay, so that is possible. It's not used that much because uh, typically it's going to be some sort of maintenance uh, activity where it's not the operator that's going to come in here and record downtime. It's going to be through your your maintenance uh, application, which incidentally, we have a maintenance manager application coming out here shortly that allow you to do all that break fix kind of stuff uh, within Business Central, record that downtime and everything else. But yes, you can do it in shop floor. It is there. Typically, though, uh, most people aren't using this because they don't have the operators record that downtime, but it is it is there. All right. Um, and now one other thing, speaking of sort of reason codes and downtimes and things like that, <clears throat> Um, let's say, you know, I, I did this production order earlier and, uh, it's come back to me and, you know, I was supposed to weld it. I welded it. I sent it off to, you know, the next station and they give it back to me and say, it's, it's wrong. There's something wrong. With it. And now I need to rework this, this part. Now there's a few ways you can do rework in business central, right? What I'm talking about here is sort of in process rework where, yes, I welded this. I handed it to the next guy. He looked at me like I was crazy. He handed it back and said, fix it. And now I need to go in and I still want to record time against that, um, you know, production order. Uh, I still want to record time against that operation because that's, that's what I'm doing. I'm doing the welding again, but I want to flag that time as exception. Now again, there's lots of ways you can do rework. A lot of people create new operations for that rework. They maybe even create a brand new production order for that rework, that sort of thing. But in this case, where it's sort of that in process rework, it's really simple. All I do at this point is I say, okay, I'm about to start, you know, welding this again, and it's not my fault. I'm going to blame somebody else. I feel like blaming sales. Team. So what I did there was I scanned a barcode that flagged this time as exceptional time. It's rework time, and the root cause of that rework is is the sales guy. Maybe he sold something that wasn't possible, or who knows what happened. By the way, that's why you need a product configurator because it prevents the sales guys from, you know, selling something that's all possible if you if you configure those products to or configure it. Anyway. Uh, that root cause of sales, that allows me to do reporting now to figure out, you know, where all my lost time is coming from. Let's not blame, let's not blame sales. Let's blame, you know, material defect or, or whatever. 
So you can create whatever codes you want. See all these rework codes down here? You can create whatever codes you like there to track, you know, the reason for this rework. And the reason I'm going on about this is it's very important. Like rework is expensive and you may not even know how much rework cost you're incurring today if you don't have a tool like this, right? So if I spend an hour reworking this, that's probably costing me three hours of time. The hour it took me to do it the first time, the hour of rework time, the lost hour of time, I could have been doing something more productive, all the QC time, NCR, all that other overhead. That's expensive stuff. Being able to go beep, blame somebody else, about for this, which of course I like doing, uh, and then having somebody being able to go in and figure out why we're wasting that time. Like maybe it's always engineering. Maybe they're they're consistently sending out, you know, uh, bad drawings or something like that. Or maybe it's uh, material defects in a specific vendor every time. So now I can figure out what's causing that rework. Save me a ton of money. That alone, that little feature there alone, often is enough to pay for for shop floor and stuff. Just just as as it sounds there. Okay. All right. Um, so uh, I think I answered the question on uh, uh, multiple uh, production orders and work centers going on at the same time. Yes, absolutely. The operator can do multiple production orders, work centers at the same time. Oh, and incidentally, you can have different people working on the same production order at the same time as well. This one here, this operation 10 for this production order here, is also clocked in uh, by by Linda, right? So if I go to Linda's and look at her her time card, there's that operation ten, and, uh, and there you go, right? So that's not a problem either. Okay, now that's the the basics. So we we covered off actually quite a bit of uh, stuff here, where you know we looked at. I'm just going to go back to uh, back to myself stories and into the uh, chat window there. I'm going to go back to myself here uh, to log in. And we covered a bunch of stuff like we've got output, consumption, we've got quality, we've got late documents, we've got work instructions, we've got all of that stuff, even, you know, the ability to see a visual schedule if I set some, some dates here and record downtime. All of that's in the system. You don't have to use any of it if you don't want. Okay? If all you care about is labor time, it's beep beep. You can hide all this stuff over here. The user sees a very simple thing. You can even hide most of these fields here. The user sees a very simple thing that go beep, beep, and you've now got an accurate uh, time capture for the shop floor percent. And then if you want to use all this other stuff, yeah, go to town. You can add that in any time uh, you like, or just basically what I did there, make it visible, and now it's not going to do consumption, and we're good to go. Okay. Um, now, what this looks like in Business Central uh, real quick, is, oh, actually, before I go into Business Central, I forgot to show you, and I've been talking way too much, so we've gone way over the, the time I was just spent. What I wanted to do is just briefly show you, you know, this is uh, a device, you know, sort of running in, in my hand right now, um, that uh, it's like a phone-style device, but it's actually a, a barcode scanner. As a matter of fact, let me just show you my, uh, uh, my webcam here. There it is. So that's the device uh, that I'm, I'm running on uh, on my desktop. And, uh, you know, this is if you want each person to have a tablet or a phone where, you know, it's a personal device interface. And uh, what I can do is, well, that's that's my sort of daily overview when I clock down or when I clock out, you know, what I've done so far this week. And then I can come in and, you know, look at my, look at, I'm not looking at the screen, look at my time card for the day. Uh, look at all the production orders, and then I can just sort of basically, you know, clock in or clock off on those production orders uh, right from from the screen, right? So, uh, and same thing with with jobs as well. And when I'm clocked in to these uh, production orders, let's actually uh, clock clock into one of them. When I'm clocked into these production orders, I can also do. It's just busy connecting here to Business Central. Yeah, so I can also come in here. And do consumption, output, all of those same sorts of things. Look at the, the work instructions. Sorry, it's hard to um, when I'm, the screen is an angle towards me, so it's hard for me to uh, to figure out what the heck I'm, I'm tapping on here. But I can actually come in here and uh, you know do work instructions, do uh, you know uh, consumption, do output, all of that kind of stuff. 
uh, from this, this screen as well, right? So this is the personal device interface that you can use. This also runs in a full screen within uh, Business Central as well. So if you want to use this interface, you don't want to use it on a personal device. You actually want to use it on a uh, full screen terminal. You can do that as well. So that's what this guy looks like here. So this is the, uh, just gotta refresh the screen. There's also a tablet version, which looks better on a, on a full screen. But if you just want to log into Business Central directly and you don't want to use that interface I was just showing you, you can do this right from within Business Central, you know, log in on a terminal and you can clock in, clock out, do all of that stuff, uh, right from within Business Central on a screen like this instead of you know, being saying that, that shop floor interface that I showed you earlier. Okay. And I would use the, uh, uh, the tablet version, which, which shows uh, a few different fact boxes and things like that. All right. So that's the, uh, the personal device interface and the business center, business center interface. The typical business central role center is pretty basic. Everything I've done within the shop floor, uh, inside interface shows up here in business central. Like here's the time card from today. I can open that up. I can see everything that I've done on that specific uh, time card, everything else. And if you have engineers and, and personnel in the office that need to record their time, they can do it right within Business Central. They can come in here and you can do very basic data entry that allows me to enter, you know, engineering time on production orders or time against jobs or just salary time, right? Like, you know, how many hours a, a week I work from a salary perspective. So you do have that ability to do that, those time cards within Business Central from the personal device interface or from the shop floor insight uh, terminal view as well. And normally what I do is I go through the time card approval screen and it will really quickly. What this allows you to do, you know, technically it's optional, but really you want to have a lead hand or a supervisor at the end of the day go through and do those uh, time card approvals. And what that allows you to do Let's go in there. I'm just going to, because I'm a super user, I'm allowed to see everybody. What I'm going to do is I'm going to open it up. And uh, what this list shows me is all the time cards in the system. And typically, if I'm a supervisor that's, you know, uh, got, you know, four or five people working for me, I'll see four or five time cards in here, right? So this list will show me the people that report to me. I'll get one time card per person for what they were doing that day. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look for anything that's red. Red means there's an exception. There's a potential error. There's a validation error, we call it, on that time card. And over here, it tells me what those errors are. So first of all, they were supposed to work nine hours uh, today, and they didn't. They only worked, you know, whatever it is, uh, 11.11 hours. Um, then down here, we've got some line-level details. So it highlights what the issues are on the time card lines themselves and gives me those details. Okay? So... What I would do is look for anything that's red, correct those issues as a, as a supervisor. I have full control over this. When I'm done, I hit approve and, and it's good. So if I've got 10 people reporting to me, this is a few minutes every day to make sure that the time is going into the production orders appropriately. But even before I approve that time, all of that information is in the production order. I can jump in there. This is the guy I was scanning most on. I can jump in there and I can see exactly what's going on uh, on that production order at any point in time uh, right from the uh, right from the routings itself. So if I come in here, I can see, or is it? Well, I, I use this production order a lot in demo, so I've got a lot of time on it. But you can see all the time that, that's being put against it that hasn't been approved and posted yet. I can drill into that, see exactly who's worked on it, what they've done, have they had rework, all of those sorts of things are right there at my finger. All right, we're going to get out of the demo here because i got a couple of little things to cover off. Am I? All right, so cost. Um, now, the way it's licensed is uh, by employee. So for last year, you have to buy an employee license, uh, anywhere from about 3 bucks a month up to close to 8 bucks a month, depending on the, the number of uh, employees you get and your um, – you know, your subscription period, so like a three-year subscription, which, by the way, annual and three-year subscriptions, you can cancel anytime you like, so there's no risk, but anywhere from about three bucks uh, a month and up. Uh, those terminals that we talked about, 
you can run them with a team member license. Okay. Uh, but that means, you know, each person that uses that terminal is going to need a team member license. And sometimes that's, that's an appropriate one to use. If you've only got, you know, two people using a terminal, that's a, a cheap way to, to get access to that terminal. However, the most common is the device license. Those are concurrent. And so if I've got 20 terminals out there, but there's only ever three in use at a given time, right? So somebody actually actively scanning. I only need three device licenses. So those are concurrent. They're shared in that whole pool of terminals that you have out there on the shop floor. Okay. So that's the most common. Those are about 40 bucks US for uh, that shared license. And that gives you the ability to do consumption and output. The team member does not give you the ability to do consumption and output. Okay. Now, there was a question earlier on, you know, that communication hub. That communication hub uses a uh, basically a single license connection. That doesn't mean, like, technically you get a, you, you can you, you use one license or you can use one license for all your terminals. But really, to stay um, compliant with the licensing, you need one device license for every terminal uh, that's active simultaneously, and that's from Microsoft. Uh, implementation, we'll do fixed price implementations. Your partner might do uh, do the implementation for you. Um, pretty straightforward, pretty quick and easy usually. And then uh, the terminals you put out there, you know, typically commodity like an old PC or Chrome uh, book or something like that, and a barcode scanner, and you're good to go. All right. Now, um, you know, after you look at all the costs, you do have an ROI calculator on the website, and you can uh, also get an Excel version if you want to share it around. But you plug in all your, your numbers here, and it's going to spit out what we expect the payback uh, period to be. So if you get an annual subscription, how long does it take you to pay back that annual subscription? And this is sort of a perpetual number. Usually we see, you know, uh, a couple months at most, to, to pay for that annual subscription based on all the savings that you get, just manual data entry, better analysis, all of those sorts of things come into play. And really, this thing is, is a no-brainer. It pays for itself really within months, typically. But if you do have additional questions, um, you, know, you can contact us online, uh, or you can, um, uh, you know, on the website, or you can contact your partner, and uh, they may be able to help you out with, you know, more formal quotes or additional detail or if you need to set up sort of a more, um, you know, interactive uh, demo uh, with us. Thanks, everybody, for attending. Uh, hope you have a great rest of the week. And again, let us know if you have any additional questions. We'd be happy to help you out. Thanks, everyone. Hey, thanks for watching. If you enjoyed this video, give it a thumbs up and share your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to subscribe for more great content and remember to hit that bell icon to stay updated. See you in the next video.